Um, and then the, the other thing is, is trying to encourage you to, to, to do this type of research as you investigate what's going on on your own networks. Uh, so a brief uh, outline a threat, and we'll look at sort of turning the threat on its head and using uh, uh, it as a resource uh, once you've identified a threat. Uh, and then talk about building a method to do this uh, with vis-a-vis uh, -vis China, maybe uh, uh, the Middle East, uh, so you can take it in different directions. And then we'll talk about the, uh, the law and where international law stands on the subject. Uh, so with Russia, very strong in math and science. Uh, they have a history in the Cold War of looking at America through a certain lens and uh, taking our products apart no matter what they may be. If you talk to Russians, they have a healthy culture of reverse engineering in general. Uh, they've assured me that, that uh, when you're growing up in a Russian household uh, and your lamp breaks or your toilet doesn't flush, you don't just pick up the phone and call somebody, you try to figure out how to fix it yourself first. And so this lends to a hacker uh, culture uh, that, is, that is strong. Uh, the other thing is the economy may not be quite where it needs to be. This is also true in a country like Egypt that has a great university system, good education, but just not nearly enough jobs to fill the graduates that come out. And so they may move into other uh, areas of the economy. So if you just look, this is a brief so slide. You know, we, we think Windows is expensive and we think Microsoft Office is expensive, but I mean, if it was, you know, if it costed you your, a month's salary, you can kind of imagine, uh, you know, your willingness to pay for it at that point, probably not too likely. Uh, cybercrime, okay, there's a long history of cybercrime from Russia. Uh, Vladimir Levin in the mid-1990s uh, manipulated Citibank's cash management system over 40 times taking $10 million out of it. So it's one of the few cases, though, of a successful bilateral uh, joint uh, law enforcement operation. Uh, and what happened was they got most of that money back, but they never did figure out how he did it, how he got in to begin with. Uh, the Microsoft source code hack, again, went back to St. Petersburg. Uh, this guy named Joy Lopez in Florida recently, very interesting case. What happened with him? Core flood virus. So he's got a Trojan on his system somebody logs in uh, from a couple of former Soviet Union states and they take about $90,000 out of his account, ship it back to Latvia. Now the problem with Joe Lopez was that they had his legitimate login and, and password and he didn't have that much of a case. Bank of America told him, they said, look, it's not our fault, it's your computer that was hacked. Somebody logged in with your password and moved the money. Um, so he turned around and said, look, I don't know anybody in the former Soviet Union and you should know that malicious code is out there and you should know that large transfers to uh, um, suspect countries, you know, you should alert the, uh, the client. In any case, uh, it's a sticky situation uh, because uh, it's his box that was hacked and not the banks. This guy you may or may not remember, he spoke uh, uh, four years ago in Apollo over here. And uh, I saw his presentation just before he was arrested by the FBI. And essentially, he was for $99 offering you a program that would remove all copyright, all copy, paste, uh, edit, read restrictions on ebook, Adobe uh, product. Uh, and so uh, he was working for a Chicago firm at the time. And this got really messy because the EFF got involved and nobody wanted the bad PR, least of all. Uh, Adobe or the uh, United States government, whose law enforcement agencies uh, also uh, employed Elcomsoft, which was the company that uh, hired uh, Dimitri and made the product. So with a lot of these cases, again, there's just a few fish in the sea that get arrested, but usually not too much happens with them. What I want to suggest here is if you have a true uh, zero-day exploit, uh, you can turn that into cash. And this is what the Russians are doing now. Uh, they've got a great uh, sort of a bag of tricks and what they're doing is through uh, internet worms like Bagel and uh, MyDoom, they're, they're compromising your systems and what they're doing is just lifting off the, uh, the financial information. So related to PayPal, related to eBay, it's usually not for distributed denial of service, it's usually not for spam, although it can be, but what they want is your personal financial information and they take advantage of, uh, of an exploit uh, to, to increase revenue. Uh, so millions of credit cards. Uh, last year in England, 
Uh, where there is money, you will see a lot of interesting uh, activity. So with international gambling, if they're offline for a couple hours, that's a whole lot of money that they're going to be losing. So with the distributed denial of service uh, uh, attacks versus the uh, international gambling, they typically uh, would hit them with maybe a sin flood, followed by a letter which said, look, we can take you offline if you don't pay us, say, $50,000 a week, which is not much for international gambling. By the way, the Sands Institute estimates that about 7,000 uh, companies at any given time are paying extortion money to some online uh, attacker. Uh, but in this case, uh, again, there were some arrests made, and uh, uh, one success story from last year. Here is a case uh, which, is, which is really very important for a couple reasons. Uh, one, it was so severe that uh, Microsoft changed its normal patch schedule, which was pretty rigid, uh, and they were willing to, to, uh, to come out with patches around their normal schedule. And two, the U.S. CERT uh, advised at least uh, the folks who work uh, in Washington, Washington D.C. Beltway area in the United States government uh, to not use IE, to use something else, or at the very least disable JavaScript. Uh, but what happens here, uh, again, with the internet worms uh, out there likely uh, compromising uh, Microsoft IIS, uh, then taking advantage of uh, holes in IE to uh, redirect you invisibly to this IP address in China that would download a key logger onto your system and basically pull off financial information, credit card and P PayPal and eBay and the like. So Russian malware really falls under every kind of category uh, you know, from backdoor to downloader to, uh, uh, to spam tool. Uh, so they, they, they fall into every category. Social engineering, okay? There's a social engineering aspect in, in, in any uh, good attack. And with the Russians, they've got a very powerful one. And in in, uh, a lot of uh, people are looking for girlfriends. They're looking for love, right? And so Russians taking advantage of this. I'll just tell you a couple of stories. There's a Canadian guy who uh, had his uh, Russian girlfriend and was sending her a lot of money, and it was they, the, the, way it, the way it transpired, it made it very easy for this man, okay? He could, he had a virtual girlfriend, uh, Alfia Madvieva, I think, so it, he could go into a virtual store and buy her virtual gifts and get email back from her thanking for all this great uh, attention. The problem was there was no store, there was no gifts, and there was no girlfriend. It was just a couple uh, in Russia that had this scam going. They made about $300,000 on it. And, of course, they would write emails all day long saying, I love you, thank you very much. Uh, so uh, there was another case in which an Australian man uh, wrote to Vladimir Putin directly, and he said, look, I've been looking for my girlfriend. I even went to Russia, couldn't find her. Can you help me? There was an arrest made in that case as well. Uh, but it's a big problem because uh, it's playing on some of the basic human uh, needs, right? And, but the U.S. Embassy in Moscow gets about 10 calls a day complaining of somebody not being able to find their, their, their uh, online girlfriend. <clears throat> so uh, criminal communication, okay, it can start in public web forums. Uh, there is, I'll show you one here, uh, and then we'll jump back. Uh, but uh, so there's uh, public spaces in which uh, if you own, uh, you know, proxies or you uh, or your money launder, that kind of thing, you can put teasers out there in public web forums. OK, so then you can contact somebody and then they become closed and you need, you know, registration and you need recommendations and that kind of thing. Uh, and the real communication then is, is uh, usually uh, uh, it's, uh, you know, uh, uh, the word I'm looking for, not proprietary, but the homegrown code, uh, or so, you know, something that makes it very hard to, to trace at that point. However, he, here's one example, and here's some uh, sites you, you could check out. Um, but again, you, you want to announce your service and uh, you eventually make your nickname known through the, uh, the uh, delivery of good, uh, goods and services uh, uh, through these sites. And... Uh, you might get paid through web money. This is, we're very familiar with e uh, P PayPal in this country, but in this case, uh, this is, uh, web money is a service that was started in, in Russia. And uh, I talked to a couple of Russian guys uh, about this, and, and uh, they, you know, they talked about how as soon as you, you get on, you want to get on a good site, right, uh, where, you know, that's legit, essentially. 
Uh, but they, they, the administrators of that site will check out your goods and services fairly quickly uh, and decide whether they want to keep you on or, or banish you for, forever. Uh, where's seen? Uh, Drink or Die is a really big group. Uh, they started in Russia in 93, moved all over the world. Uh, there was uh, one of the biggest international operations, uh, law enforcement, it revolved around Drink or Die. It was called Operation Buccaneer. There was a guy, Bandito, was in Australia. The Saint was in Arizona, not too far from here. Uh, and this guy's server had tens of thousands. It was so large, it was named the God Complex. And uh, these guys were arrested. Uh, but again, a uh, very sophisticated group. They specialize in application software, tens of thousands of cracks, and uh, uh, very good at what they do. And uh, typically, the members only know each other's nicknames, and it's very uh, strictly uh, compartmentalized, the organization, and very difficult to... Uh, uh, it's kind of like an Al-Qaeda cell, right? You take out one, and you don't really know. They, they're not necessarily going to know. Uh, the other two uh, guys on either side of them in the cell. A uh, little bit different topic, uh, hacktivism. Uh, when the United States went, uh, joined the conflict in the Balkans and started bombing Serbia, uh, again, national emotions run very high. And you'll find that a lot of activity that takes place in cyberspace, particularly involved uh, uh, defacement and denial of service attacks, mirrors what's going on in the real world. You see this with the, uh, the EP3 that was downed, our EP3 in China. There's a whole lot of hacker activity and sort of the aborted uh, US-Chinese uh, hacker war that took place uh, during that time frame or almost took place. Uh, in the Middle East, you'll see when there's a suicide bombing uh, or when there is a, uh, an assassination of uh, the Palestinian leader by the Israelis, you'll see a whole lot of the web defacements and analysis of service activity going on. In this case, Russians very upset about our stance because they're very close to the Serbians. Uh, so they did, uh, there, were, there was a lot of activity sort of against UK and US sites. We claim there was no impact and the UK admitted to having lost some military databases. Espionage is a bit more serious. Here's the current uh, alphabet soup for, for the, the Russians, okay? The KGB is the, 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 the uh, old institution. SVR would equate to CIA, FSB, FBI, and FABC, NSA. Just point to the case of Robert Ham Hansen, really, uh, because this, this is already not new news, uh, but this is the kind of spy that uh, if you are... Uh, responsible for the protecting a network or protecting any type of national secret, uh, you want to consider that spies are going to be moving uh, in a vastly different direction than you might be familiar with in the movies. I know James Bond uses to turn one page over at a time and photocopy it. Well, now, of course, you can stick a USB drive into and take literally every document your entire agency is working on out of the office with you. Uh, so it's a big problem. Robert Hansen, 20 years ago, was already sending encrypted uh, bulletin board messages. Um, he hacked into the account of his superior. He was working all the databases at FBI, uh, and there was no real limitations on what he could do, searching for his own name, searching on dead drops, searching on Russians, and see if there was any connection that somebody may have suspected him. So about 15 years, he literally gave away just about every important secret uh, to the Russians that you might think of. He was ideally placed. He was the chief of Russian counterintelligence at FBI, which gave him access to just about everything. But very computer savvy, so kind of the spy potentially of the future. Uh, information warfare, you might be familiar with the uh, revolution in military affairs. Essentially, that is electronic command and control. So it's, it looks a lot, like more, a lot more like the video game you're playing, right? Uh, the planes in the future are going to be a lot more uh, pilotless planes. I mean, why, I mean you know, 90% of the uh, avionics, electronics, and protection mechanisms and all that into a fighter jet are for the pilot. It's, it's crazy now, and, and people are realizing that. It's just a, it's sort of an outdated and, and a romantic notion of, of uh, the Air Force. In the future, it's going to be pilotless, I promise you. The Revolution of Military Affairs, essentially what that means is everything is going to be cyber and metric and uh, network and database-centric. Um, the great 
goal of the thinkers is, you know, you want a digital Pearl Harbor. If you're going to go to war with another nation state, you would like to be able to win it without taking any casualties. You'd like to be able to turn off the lights. And, you know, when, so when somebody pulls a trigger, nothing happens. That's the goal here. I mentioned Electronic Russia. That is just a project that the FSB is getting underway in order to, to, to get the word out to citizens and to the agencies and corporations to start thinking in terms of better computer network defense. And just, just for the record, the, 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 they're getting very little money and attention on this, and it's really worrisome to the Russian, Russian employees who actually are involved in this project. Okay, cyber war in practice. Uh, this, is, this is interesting because it's actually something tangible that we can point to. Uh, the war in Chechnya, southern Russia, uh, really ugly. Uh, it, the, as it started, the Russians uh, disallowed any mil media involvement, and that turned out to be really bad PR for them uh, because essentially the Chechens came in and they, brought, they showed all the media types exactly the story they wanted, to, they wanted them to see. So the word getting out to the international media, the word getting out to the international media was uh, not at all what the Russians wanted. They only showed them Chechen dead bodies. Uh, so the Russians learned after that, but it did take a turn in a different direction. Uh, when, as the war moved into the 90s, uh, Russia uh, went on the offensive in cyberspace. And uh, I'll just point to, to one particular incident to highlight uh, the, the change. If you might remember, there was uh, in Moscow the, the, uh, the hostages that took over the uh, theater. Well, that, that lasted for a number of days, and at the end, Russian commandos stormed the theater. Right when that happened, uh, several Chechen websites went off the air. So you can only assume from that that it was a coordinated campaign, you know, by the Russians and, and you know, they, on multiple fronts. Uh, it just, for the record, one of the servers was located in the United States. So, you know, you can assume that the Russians, you know, took down a, a uh, you know, a U.S.-based website, uh, you know, uh, for what that's worth. A threat summary. Okay, post-Soviet Union. Um, as freedoms sort of grow, at the, you know, at the end of the post, they're moving toward a market economy and democratization and all that. We've seen a lot of, uh, you know, from, from the tennis players and, and all this uh, coming out of the Soviet Union, uh, we also see uh, a lot of good malicious code and a lot to be worried about potentially on your networks, particularly as it involves financial crimes. Uh, one of the things about the organized cybercrime, or the organized cybercrime is that it does inhibit that, that, that part of the market economy that will allow products to be legitimate, to be sold legitimately on the street. Uh, you know, when you, know, you can buy office on, on the street for a couple of dollars, right, that's been cracked and, and sold. Uh, from one viewpoint, that's a good thing. From another, it sort of inhib inhibits the uh, market economy growth. The other thing is a lot of this money is recycled into to more nefarious crimes. So you have to be aware of, uh, aware of that as well. Okay, so we've established that Russia is a threat. Now, you sort of want to turn it on its head and say, okay, now they've got great math and science, great coders, et cetera, et cetera. We want to turn that into a resource. So hacker sites, there, there's no end of them. You can find them very quickly, but I think for a lot of people, the language barrier would be the first thing that would inhibit you from, from trying to exploit this as a resource. Here are some sites where you can start. Uh, looking at them. Here's one, the, maybe the, the, the Civil Hacker School is sort of the, the analogous to the Academy in France that, that uh, is very well known and in the news. This site you'll find everything in English as well as in Russian, so I don't need you to, to help you with that really. But what we will look at is a Russian language site. So here I took one with a lot of things that we can sort of dissect and pick apart. But again, it's all in Russian. So if you don't speak Russian, you're like, how am I going to do this? Well, I'll show you how in a second. Uh, but first of all, I'll just sort of look at the, uh, the, the material on the site, and you'll find that it looks a whole lot like, uh, you know, a site that your own language wants to just translate the words. So, uh, Hacker, essentially, you'll find that the Russians have no problem sort of incorporating foreign words into their language. French hate that, right? They've outlawed the use of the word email in France, but no problem with that in Russian. So, Hacker is a hacker. Zlom is an attack. Zashita defense. Programmirovanya iskodniki khalyava soft i So I won't uh, take, take you any further in Russian, but so you can hear a little bit of it. And uh, this is the motto of the site. 
And here's sort of how it breaks down. We've got training, a lot of downloads, uh, and some hacker tools. And uh, so here's a place you could go, for instance, to, to find, and, and once, you just, once you grab a software translation tool off the internet, you'll find that there might be a lot of stuff here that you could exploit uh, in, in really just a few minutes that you may never have imagined you could have otherwise. So just the top, you, here you see archive of articles, right? You can see commentary, how many times it's been read, when it was posted, etc. The top one, for instance, I'll just translate the top one. It says, uh, essentially it means how to seize a lame uh, IRC channel. So it's been read 10 times and you, you just click on it to download or email. Um, here's the downloads, and again, it, go, it goes into to, uh, different categories, but uh, in terms of exploits and uh, articles uh, and various tools like scanners. Here's the top 10 downloads. I kind of matched them against the insecure.org ones, and it wasn't a very good match, so potentially I don't know that a lot of the, the, the names haven't been necessarily changed, but what, what I'm suggesting here is you may find things here. Uh, that you don't, uh, that you may not find uh, in the normal repositories that, in which you look, and uh, if you're a coder, of course, you might you might be able to also uh, pick apart things. Uh, you might not be able to read the, the comments, uh, but uh, but I'll show you how to do that. Here's the discussion forums on the site. And again, it's not that difficult, and I've done it. You, you know, you're all used to having a couple of windows open on your uh, desktop, you know, just to translate something in one of the online services and drop that in a chat window. It just takes a second, really, to go back and forth between the two. Uh, so here's hacker tools, right? The three main ones on the site. So the scanner email uh, and DNS. You know, so I just asked it. I said, hey, why don't you scan the Kremlin for me and tell me what ports are open? So it, you know, it's the kind of thing where you could, uh, you know, again, you're using somebody's tool in their environment or in their milieu, which might be, a, which, which might be a good idea, and offer you some some benefits. Uh, so it even has a word of the day. In this case, you know, Big Brother is always watching. Don't forget. Here's two guys who maintain the site. You can email them with any questions. Uh, I guess they, you know, they, they. Uh, sure speak enough English to, to get by. Okay, now you're like, what am I going to do with all this? And, you know, uh, anyway, so very easy. Uh, software translation is not too bad, especially if you know enough words in a particular discipline to get by. Uh, in your case, uh, uh, you know, network security and hacking terminology, you're, you're familiar with so many words that you could essentially look at a machine, a machine translation and get by a lot quicker than you think. So natural language processing is again, it's bringing in human languages uh, into, into software. And machine translation, this is taking one language and translating it into another, it's much more sophisticated than word for word. Now they incorporate a lot of grammatical rules, they've got idioms in there, and now they've got this really great feature, or a feature they've got, the, uh, part of the development process, what they'll do, because they know that professional translators have already done so much of the work for them, what they'll do is they'll just feed it novels. I talked to one guy who works for a company, and they fed it like every Tom Clancy novel, right? They fed their, their big machine every Tom Clancy. And what, that, what it does is when then you ask it to translate something from English to Russian or Russian to English, it already, you know, you know, fat Tom Clancy novels are. It's got about 30 of them in there. It's got many more than that. It's actually got millions of... of of uh, or thousands of books, millions of phrases, but it's already it's what it's doing is it's taking a professionally translated uh, uh, translation and and giving you essentially what a person did who was trained in the discipline. So you, you'll find professional translations on the web, and these are a help if you really want to study the language, and, and these can can be pretty good. Uh, just for the same reason, you'll find War and Peace in every bookstore. You'll also find good articles about hacking. You'll find them as well in other languages, you know, whether you study Chinese or Arabic. These, these can be kind of cool to look at. Uh, there's a lot of free services, uh, and these aren't too bad if you don't know about AltaVista. Just go to AltaVista and click on translation, and they've got a nice long list now, and it, bi-directional of a lot of languages that you can, uh, can just can go back and forth in for free. There's commercial translation that can get quite expensive. <clears throat> so we'll just look at translation briefly, uh, translation software. So here's Smashing the Stack, which is admittedly is a very difficult text. And what I'm going to do is actually give it a very difficult assignment, is, is I'm asking this 
is Alta Vista, right, Babelfish, to go to Russian and then jump back to, to English. Never try this with Shakespeare. It comes out really, really bad. But with this, you'll find, especially if it's in a discipline, especially if something like the weather, especially if it's uh, something that relatively has a limited vocabulary, it's, it's quite good. So take smashing the stack into to, uh, to Russian and then back to English. So you'll find it's to break the stack. You know, so that's not really great. And you'll also find that C programming, there's no real C in Russian. So C became chair, right? When it comes back, since there's no matchup, yeah, they, it, for whatever reason, it said, oh, it must be an H. So then you wind up with H programming. That's not great either. But overall, I'm, I'm telling you, this is, just took a second to do, and you can actually uh, walk your way through it without too much of a, a problem. Uh, Rusified software, you'll find already, uh, Windows uh, uh, actually is very friendly to Cyrillic now, and uh, it's actually quite good. You just do a left shift and alt, and it'll take you back and forth between the two, just about in any Windows tool uh, that's out there. Uh, I'm not so sure. I, I was told that Mac is, that's not the case for Mac, and I'd be surprised if, if Linux, but, you, but, you know, with, with uh, uh, Windows has it covered. Okay, now let's try to turn this into a bit of a method so that you can take it in different directions because uh, you might not be so interested in Russia, but you might be interested in some different topics in which uh, I hope that this may help you. So I had to think of some way to, to bring this together, so I, I noticed that T's were one way I could possibly do that. So just suggesting that you might want to know something about the country before you invade it or before you take on uh, its networks. Um, you know, you, the more you know about history, culture, etc., language too, uh, it's going to help you I enormously to, to understand where they're coming from and where you should be going as well. Uh, the terrain, we're probably going to talk about the telecoms and the uh, internet infrastructure in a country, the techniques, uh, you know, hacker groups and tools, that kind of thing. There's a lot of good resources for that. And the translation, essentially, I think that's really the key to sort of breaking, breaking the barrier here. Okay, Russia, I'll give you just 30 seconds. 12th century, they kicked out the Mongols. 17th century, they took Siberia. Uh, the communist revolution in 1917, you know, lasted 70 years. Uh, now they've got kind of three things going on. They're trying to develop democracy. They're trying to develop their economy. And they're dealing with the war in Chechnya, which is, which is a big deal. Um, so they've got, they don't have 50 states, they've got 49 oblasts, they've got 21 republics, 10 okrugs, 6 cries, 2 federal cities, and 1 Jewish autonomous republic. So it looks a lot different uh, than uh, the country you might be from. Uh, but again, uh, the more you know, and just you could just read you know, a couple articles just to kind of get you in the mood to take on, uh, take on the Russians. Okay. The, the little thing, that's, that's what you may be used to looking at when you open your atlas in terms of a ge geography of another country. But let's look at the big one, which I think is really, it's, a, it's actually really quite interesting. Here is the three main fiber optic lines in Russia. They're ATM based, so they're, they're heterogeneous. They got, they got uh, video, voice, and data. And they run from St. Petersburg in the north, who runs up into Scandinavia. Down to the, you see the 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 uh, the, uh, the, the, juxtap the uh, cross there. That's Moscow. Goes down and toward the Middle East, um, and then out uh, to to the Far East. And these are the three the three main lines that data is going to travel across as it goes through Russia. It goes down to Novorossiysk, and then over here it goes to Khabarovsk, and then to Horbin in in uh, in China. And again. Here, it, you'll see that in the middle, there's almost no color there. And that says it's almost completely undeveloped. And what you'll find as you go further into Siberia, there's many more reindeer than there are human beings. Uh, and so what you're going to find up there is satellite communications uh, and very few landlines. Uh, and part of the problem with, with Russia now is everybody is moving to Moscow and St. Petersburg with the market economy. Nobody's still, nobody's staying on the collective farms anymore. And they've got a, you know, they've got freedom, they've got freedom of movement, and they can move to the big city, and that's what everybody's doing. Uh, and so a lot of these outlying areas are, are, are in real trouble. Okay, Russian telecommunications. Uh, RU is, is a Russian uh, 
um, digraph uh, SU, which uh, several parties are fighting over still for some reason, but that belongs to the, belong to the former Soviet Union. Uh, and then you can actually count the number of uh, internet hosts and users and telephones. <coughs> Talked about the trunk lines. Uh, but again, a little research will, will yield quite a lot uh, in, in terms of uh, the basics of the numbers of people, the, uh, the, the connection, the numbers in, in order to get on the right connections and to get into a country. RUNET is an interesting concept. It's kind of like uh, ChinaNet or AOL. Right, it is a intranet that you like. You might belong on, in your organization or your, your uh, university, uh, but it's essentially a sort of a cocoon of sorts uh, that's kind of generated by Russians and for Russians, and is largely in Russia. And his uh, guy interviewed uh, his network security guys, not only for the smart people, but also for the, the largely for the stupid users. Uh, so, but it's essentially Russian cyberspace. Internet usage by country, here just quickly, Russia has a relatively small um, percentage of its, of its population that may be online compared to, say, Scandinavia, but they got a lot more people. So what that means is actually you're gonna you could potentially deal with three or four times the number of Russians as you could Scandinavians online uh, just by the sheer numbers, and so that's something you, you, you might forget. Again, more color to less color means more connections to less connections. Uh, here's an interesting slide. You consider that some countries, you probably heard the phrase, all, road, all roads lead to Rome. Well, when I was in England, too, they assured me that even uh, the smallest village has a street that is pointed directly toward London. Uh, so what I want you to see here is essentially the spoke pattern uh, for probably most networks that you would encounter in Russia. If you want to get from point A to point B, you got to go through Moscow, essentially. Uh, and this is really good to know, uh, you know, when you are crossing networks uh, so that you know if I want to go uh, somewhere, potentially somebody could collect or s see me along the way. Here's the, probably the, here's the most sophisticated map I could find. There you see the satellites, you know, uh, out uh, that are uh, connecting the more uh, remote parts of the country. Um, I think I've covered most of the points I wanted to, uh, to cover here already. We'll move on. Uh, now, you can rely on finding things like this uh, on the internet, work that people have already done for you, or you could do it yourself. You know, and one way you could do that that's relatively uh, uh, painless is with, with trace routes. And they tell you so much about networks and so much about, uh, you know, connectivity issues uh, that uh, very worthwhile. So just, you know, you, here is a way you could do it with a program like Visual Route, but here's a you know, way with Trace Routes that you could uh, uh, do it on your own uh, and then build a little map like this. And you can see, you know, dissecting the, the words uh, in, in uh, the resolution uh, and just connecting the dots, essentially. Uh, and you can, uh, you can you see where the important parts are. And you can see, for instance, so many things through trace routes, like if you want to go from here to the Congo, you may have to go through Egypt or through South Africa, and really there's no other way to do it. And this, this is the kind of thing that'll, that'll, that'll show you that. However, with Russia, you can actually build a nice little network map uh, relatively quickly. Here's some major IP ranges to get you started if you don't already have them. But again, these are the big players in, in, uh, in Russia. Uh, and they're in charge of the networks, and you'll find, uh, you know, the Russian government and military and everybody uh, will, fall, will fall in there. And again, a lot of people are going to do work for you. Like, if you're interested in tracing spam or you're interested in finding the bad guys in certain uh, contexts, uh, here, here is some, uh, especially with spam, people have done a lot of the work for you, and, and they will uh, have lists already put together for, for China or Russia uh, for IP ranges. Okay, um, I had a great class a few years ago on hacking, and it, it, they, what they said was uh, the first place to start may not be entirely obvious to you, but you start with the home page, right? So in this case, here's the Russian government portal, and you'd be surprised how much information is here if you dig down into it. Um, but again, part of the problem for a Western user is uh, that, that uh, the language barrier. Here is about the only page that you'll find with a direct word-for-word -word translation, uh, and it is the, the president's page, not surprisingly. Um, here is a great site, the Russian Cybercrime Office. Again, it's only in Russian, but for some reason, the title. So it's a big, there's a whole lot of pages extending out underneath it. 
Uh, but again, cybernetic police, everything below that is, is in Russia. But there's some, great, there's some great stuff here. Started with the Spider Group. This was back in the mid-90s when Russia wanted to tackle Internet crime, and it was still real, con you know, it was a secret back then. They called them the Spider Group. But you can see some leftover vestiges of, of that here. Here's some things that fall underneath, and uh, one of the things I want to highlight here is just that if you are in law enforcement or you wanted to do a, to any type of international investigation, whether it be official or unofficial, you can see here uh, the actual what Russians consider illegal uh, and the definitions by which they might prosecute someone. Uh, so here, you know, you've got Carter, Freaker, and Hacker to start with. Uh, they have a, a site that has uh, cybercrime statistics all the way back to 1982, and I, I really thought this was quite interesting. Uh, there's a lot to go through here. So I went back to 1982 and was reading, and there was only one case from that year, and they only called her Miss K. Well, Miss K uh, was a programmer, and she was in an office uh, that was involved in doling out the funds all over the Soviet Union. And what she did was she just went in there and changed, it according to this, one number. And she would change it sometimes, and then she would change it back, and she would sort of flop. But it was essentially what it was doing, it was the old salami technique, and it was slicing, every time she did that, slicing money off of an account and going in, in a direction where, where potentially she would, she would gather it up later. Here is all of the uh, office as, that had an official website on the uh, cybercrime site. So there's 89 total. This was the number that actually had websites uh, so they were really quite cool to look through. They all had their, their uh, logos, and, and they're, they're, a lot of them are called K because uh, Kiber would be, would be cyber. So this is cyber police, Kiber Polizia. This is an interesting story. I made this slide uh, before I got an email from this guy. Uh, he is the top cyber cop in Russia. And so I read through his bio, and as you might expect, in Russia, he's very well accomplished in terms of academics, and, and they're, they're really quite good at, 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 uh, at that in the Soviet Union. And so he appears very bright and really knows what he's doing. Well, I emailed that cybercrime site. I said, well, hey, I'm going to write a presentation, and, and, and I want to know if you wanted to you know, give me any word of advice and, and help me out in any way. Well, he emails me back, the, the same guy. And uh, we had a nice little dialogue, and he answered all my questions. He was really quite friendly, and he seemed like a, a good guy. Uh, so in here, I'll just highlight some of the things. He says one of the main things from his perspective is he just, he just wants to make sure we're all on the same page, not surprisingly, uh, and that uh, for international investigation, you're talking about log file formats, you're talking about contact information and all this. He says that most of his 89 offices actually do get uh, complaints from overseas every day, the majority of them. Uh, but he says, you know, he said, and then at the bottom, he says, well, we're, we're doing our best. We're actually meeting more and more often with, with foreign counterparts, especially the FBI. Now, here's some questions that I just put together. And, I, and again, I put a lot more together than this, but this is just kind of a start. I was thinking if we could develop, you know, 100, 200 of uh, the most important, uh, you know, terminology, the most important questions to be asked for international investigations, even if you're just a system administrator or you're, you're the kind of guy who does, who reads through the log files just for fun uh, from your firewall at home, the kind of things that would uh, be able to take you across borders. I don't see any why, reason why we couldn't develop several hundred of these and get them professionally translated uh, and be able to move more quickly across, across borders. So here's just some things that I had put together uh, in that regard. Here's one word to get you started in case you're, you're I don't know, you know, I've only know a couple of, you know, only studied a couple of languages here. Uh, but again, you will find uh, a lot of hacker stuff just about in any language on the web. And the thing is, whether or not you've done this before, it, it works and, it, and it, it's, it's, it, you, you slap yourself if you've never done it. But you can, if you know, uh, for instance, the word for uh, hacker in Russian or Chinese, just take that and drop it in Google and see what comes up. And it, it works. I mean, Google knows exactly what you're talking about, right? So you can take those and you can drop them in foreign newspapers. Uh, you can drop them in sites like the, the, uh, the spam sites that I showed you in English. They've got the same thing in foreign countries. And I'll just end this section with uh, Kaspersky. According to Russian hackers, uh, the most hated man in the country. Uh, but this is a real interesting guy, and he just made his entry into the U.S. market. I'm not sure if you've heard of Kaspersky Labs or not. 
but they just incorporated the United States, and they have uh, in February uh, just uh, they you know they have big plans uh, to move outside Russia. One of the interesting things about Kaspersky is is that the Kaspersky Labs are, uh, according to technical people who look at their products, really very very good. Uh, they, their products worked very well. They seem to know exactly what they're doing in terms of writing antivirus signatures that work and that are beneficial. Um, so one of the interesting questions then, especially guys from America's perspective, especially with sort of the legacy of the Cold War and all that, is whether uh, we'll have any uh, inhibition about buying Russian products and putting them on our networks, especially if they're government uh, in nature. Okay, I'll finish. Uh, just talking about the uh, international political scene, and there's some real interesting, juicy things uh, going on uh, to think about. There's no end to the number of sites that you could start with. Here are just the UK sites that I found uh, where if you had anything uh, that fell under these categories, it'd give you a place to start uh, in the United Kingdom. But in general, international law is real ill-suited to deal with uh, the internet, and it's, it's just starting to catch up. I mean, the internet is borderless, and you can't even hope to, to sort of interview all the people who cross your borders every day, much less look at all the, all the uh, data packets. Um, again, we all know with the I love you virus and all that, in certain countries, they haven't even thought of instituting cyber crimes, and so how are you going to prosecute somebody? Uh, uh, nobody likes to extradite criminals. Nobody likes to give up any part of their national sovereignty. These are all real important issues, and they're all for good reasons. Um, if you gave up part of your national sovereignty to a foreign country, you're worried about all kinds of things from, you know, the abuse of data to espionage uh, to collecting on your citizens without their consent in a different culture, looking at your political culture and all of that. Um, so what you have is like Microsoft and Valve looking at other solutions in order to track down criminals. Uh, evidently, somebody has taken a Microsoft bounty. You know, they're not going to publish it, but, but that's what it appears has taken place. And with the case of Valve, they actually tapped their fan base and they said, can you help us here? Somebody stole, uh, you know, parts of Half-Life 2 and, and it worked. So extraterritoriality is a big issue. Um, in here, I'm primarily going to talk about uh, remote search and seizure. So we'll talk about the uh, FBI sting. And so the FBI in the year 2000, they saw all this activity coming from Russia. They weren't getting the help that they wanted from the Russians. And so they said, well, we're going to do our own research and we're going to do this. And so what they did was well, they had a couple of suspects. They went to Russian sites. They pulled down their resumes and they invited them to Seattle. Uh, to a fake company for a, an interview, and they came. And uh, it's kind of a sad story in part because they were actually quite excited about getting out of the biz and going legit. And they went to Seattle, and uh, of course, you know, the FBI guys, they said, why don't you download uh, some stuff to prove your skills to us? And of course, as soon as they did, they had their log on, username and password, and uh, they had all this evidence with which to prosecute them. So remote, remote search and seizure, it's, it's a great topic to debate uh, because uh, whether or not it, uh, in this case, the Russians went over there without the consent of the Russians. So what the Russians did was they sued us back and they said, you illegally came on our networks and, and uh, it, was, you know, it was a mess. Uh, the thing is, if you're not getting cooperation from a foreign government, you know, what do you do? You're kind of between a rock and a hard place. Is it closer to, do you think, actually sending your law enforcement over there and invading the country? Or is it closer to, say, uh, doing open source collection from newspapers or taking satellite pictures, all of which are commonly available and are not really considered espionage? Okay, one of the main things we've got going right now is the European Cybercrime Convention. Uh, but a lot of the things I just mentioned are, are the big issues. Uh, essentially, people are, are worried about uh, uh, these uh, um, national sovereignty issues. And so all we've really got on the table is closer, uh, closer uh, uh, point of contact issues. And so that's really all the national governments, I promise you, are going to allow. There is no way that a, a, na that a national government is going to allow another one to... to come in and ransack its networks looking for evidence. So just, it's about getting on the same page, it's about having the same log file formats and good points of contact. That's really all that's on the table. And I'll just leave you with a, just a short story. Uh, recently in the UK, they wanted to, to, to find some uh, malicious guys in China. And so 
they were calling over there, these UK guys trying to find somebody to talk to about it, and they had extreme difficulty. They finally found the PRC cert, and they said, you know, whether or not this is the case, this is at least exactly how it seemed to them in the UK. They could only find one person to talk to, and that guy only spoke Chinese. So uh, to make a long story short, they, ev they eventually found somebody who spoke Chinese in the UK, and they told this guy that this particular website was causing them problems, and they said it came down in a heartbeat. Uh, but that sort of, sort of the story highlights the uh, difficulties with which uh, you, you, uh, will fi you, the, you'll find in crossing international borders uh, in any of this uh, business. So thank you very much for the talk. I really appreciate it. <laughs> if you have any questions, uh, feel free just to raise your hand. So. Uh, the mob. The mob. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I tried to find... I'm sorry? Yeah, you know, I tried to talk about organized crime in, in, in the sense of, uh, you know, either the, you know, the, the Russian bride scams or the, the credit card information, the PayPal, the, um, uh, the eBay scams. There's so many things to look at. Um, the, the, the online extortion uh, against the gambling rings uh, in the UK... You know, I tried to bring up a wide variety of things, but really there's almost no end to it. You have to use your imagination, just like malicious code, right? I mean, you can do almost anything you can dream up, essentially. Uh, but yeah, it's a big problem in Russia, organized crime. And they know what they're doing. And I just read an article from last week, and uh, one of this Russian law enforcement official just said that it is so hard for them to trace cybercrime back in Russia because they're just using great techniques. He said they have a three rule in which they use at least three hops to anonymize their, 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 uh, their contact on the internet. So he said, you know, they, they never go below three. And he said two maybe is doable, but three, he said, makes it virtually impossible to, to you know, uh, to ID somebody on the internet. Uh, so it, part of the problem with Russia is very good. And one of the things I didn't say is that, that Kaspersky, in an interview recently, he said, you know, five or ten years ago, and this is maybe of interest to the crowd here, uh, hackers in Russia were largely, you know, the healthy kind. He said, but it is just moving so rapidly. He said it's gone from below 50% now to over 90% of malicious code is written by and for criminals. Uh, so he just said it's a, that, that's one thing that has taken place in the past five or ten years for malicious code in Russia is that the criminalization of the, the Internet uh, you know, is, uh, regards malicious code. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know, to be honest with you, but I do know one. She asked about uh, money laundering, and right? They're using euros. Yeah, it's a big problem. Uh, w one of the things with it, with uh, with the internet is they get. The, the right logon information for, say, a PayPal account, and it's real tough to, uh, uh, they have a legitimate transaction. In other words, they've got two uh, legitimate accounts. They transfer money, you know, from a legitimate account to a legitimate account. By the time law enforcement gets around to doing something about it, they're gone. They're, they're gone, and that money has been transferred to places which are safe for the criminals. So it's a big problem. Okay, one more question. Yeah, what? Well, let's let's. Um, I've got, he said, "Are there any good software?" He uses Translate.ru a fair bit, and I, I do as well. Standalone uh, commercial translation software. Um, 
You can look through the links. There, 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 there are a number. Uh, I noticed there are a number that are under $100. Uh, Language Weaver is, is pretty expensive, but it uses specifically that technique I talk about, and it feeds it literally hundreds of newspaper articles and, and, uh, um, and novels to do. And essentially, it is giving you a professionally translated version. It can be choppy at times. It's very expensive, but Language Weaver is, is one uh, that is that is highly regarded. It's won a lot of prizes. Well, I mean, they claim that that I think with with uh, Arabic, Chinese, and French, they're already they're already really good. And I, I think they've they've included a whole lot of stuff. Uh, Russian is coming out this year. It's not out yet. So thanks a lot. I really appreciate it. But that, that's it.